Good morning, Slash. Good morning, everybody. I'm Carolina Aguilar, as you heard, co-founder and CEO of Embrainer Electronics. We are the world is at the tipping point of exponential innovation convergence. Related to the law of the accelerated return, this means that every innovative platform that we generate creates a positive feedback and a much a speedy adoption actually accelerating innovation. And we are seeing these now powered by semiconductors. So if we look at the NASDAQ composite and the global sales in semiconductors, you see the power that this has been driving over the different innovation platforms, from personal computing to internet, mobile computing, cloud, and now the exponential curve goes into the use of new materials for semiconductors that are powering AI, generative AI uh, platforms and co-creation. And actually, when we look at the basis of all of that, it comes to a very earthy and normal material called silicon that is feeding 100, uh, sorry, 500 billion semiconductors industry with a global tech economy worth three trillion. And actually, silicon has been found in Earth. It was used by Chinese Egyptians, but from 1824 in our neighboring country, Sweden, it was isolated for the first time and then used in 1854 for manufacturing. And if we look back in time, every leap in humanity has been actually linked to a key material from a Stone Age, Bronze Age. We are in this Silicon Age with all your chips powered by silicon. But in the era of brain-computer interfacing, we are now discovering B-dimensional materials like graphene that are able to produce the next breakthrough. And that's why we are sticking to graphene. But we are not the only ones using B-dimensional materials. Actually. Advanced materials are a key strategic line of the European Union, and graphene, but also maxines, hexagonal boronitride, and others are being used in photonics, in photodetectors, in optical sensors, in batteries with companies like Barta and, and, and Siemens actually bending for them. In semiconductors, also graphene has a role. There is a very cool startup in Germany called Black Semiconductors that is revolutionizing also this field. And of course, in neural interfaces, in brain, but also others at the university and academic side, and also in China, are pioneering B-dimensional materials in neural interfaces. But why do we need this? Because after years, more than 30 years of clinical use of metals, like platinum and iridium, we were only able to decode the size of a zebra fish brain, which is about 100,000 neurons. And if we want to actually decode the brain, the brain has nearly 100 billion neurons. And one out of three people have a neurological related disorders. 30% don't respond to drugs, so they need advanced technology. And this is generating a higher cost than cancer and cardiovascular combined. Just in Spain, from 2011 to today, the number of Parkinsonian people has quadrupled. And this is also not an innovation conversion, but a big, a steep curve up that we need to do something about. So our response to this neural burden is actually combining the best of brain-computer interface for communication with the best of neuromodulation. And we are bringing high count, high density, and high resolution platforms to actually do brain-computer interface therapeutics. So a bilateral or bidirectional communication with the brain where we can read and write or decode and modulate with micrometric precision. This is how we are doing it. So actually, we are using graphene, which is the thinnest material known to men at an atom thick, but yet 200 times stronger than steel. We can put up to 1,024 contacts, and we combine it with a subcortical interface, also in high density, and with an intelligent unit that help us to drive 
real-time precision therapeutics. This platform is inserted through a 14 millimeter bore hole through the brain, through the, through the skull, and then it's sitting on the skull. And what it does is, is mapping real time with micrometric precision, pathological biomarkers, and responding real time to actually restore lost functions. For instance, in Parkinson's disease, there is freezing of gait. So we can detect these freezing of gait episodes and resynchronize gait so patients can have a normal life. Let me show you a real-time or a demo example that we presented at the AI for Good in the United Nations about how we are doing that. So again, we place the cortical interface, we place the subcortical interface, and this is now reading at micrometric resolution. The machine learning algorithm is finding the patterns of the intention of movement. So it's decoding the intention of movement of that particular patient. This is preclinical real data. So you, f you find now the path of the intention of moving one of the legs, right leg, then you will find left leg. And each of those dots are 25 micrometers, the smaller ones, and the others are 300 micrometers. So we are finding, this is a slow down data, we are finding these patterns, and if we will do it at millimetric resolution, like the current players like Medtronic, Abbott, um, we wouldn't see anything. So we will lose all capacity to actually decode. Like that, we are finding those uh, freezing of gate pathways and resynchronized gate on the other direction. This is on Parkinson's disease, and we got FDA breakthrough designation, but we are also, um, communicating and, and conducting proof of concepts in epilepsy, where actually we can understand much better compared to um, metal technology, where you have a spacing of one centimeter, what's going on on the brain. And we can understand with decoding very low frequencies below 0 0.01 hertz, um, the mounting up of the, of the seizure that is going to come in epilepsy, so we can stop it. But the best part here is that this is not science fiction. We made history in September, and this was the first time that a graphene neural interface was placed and tested in the brain of a human being. Now it's two patients. It's been cleared by MHRA to keep the study. Um, and, and this is the, the, the first time that we are proving the next generation of BCI with graphene. But that was about the central nervous system. We have the peripheral nervous system. At the end, this is all connected in one nervous system. And there's one organ, the vagus, I mean, one nerve, sorry, the vagus nerve, that connects central with peripheral and actually manages all the organs of our body, from the heart to the intestine to the lungs. So if we are able to be selective in identifying these fibers going in each of these organs, we now have a therapeutic uh, target to actually heal most part of the body without the use of drugs that usually create side effects. So our thinking is like a biotech indeed. You know, we have a pipeline of indications that we are looking at, and the ambition is to decode the entire nervous system so we can actually heal it. But what the future brings, um, the more we actually go into this law of the uh, accelerated returns, we are going to see further miniaturization, further intelligence, and we are going to be able to have really, really seamless integration with technology, enhanced brain plasticity, sensory expansion, and the most important, what we want to achieve is a self-healing neural system. Help the neural system to actually heal itself um, and maybe, you know, we can have a stroke patients recovering their stroke by using BCI therapeutics, but also learning to play piano and actually recovering their motor functions. Always, always um, under the premises of a good benefit risk ratio and neuro rights. Do you think we are at this tipping point of exponential innovation convergence? If you want to, join us. Thank you very much. Thank you.